It is wonderful to see each and every one of you with us here this morning for another time period of studying the Word of God, of worshiping His most holy name, and singing these songs of praises unto Him. We have several who are visiting here with us today. We want you to know that you are our honored guests. If you see something or hear something that spawns a question in your mind, don't hesitate to come up to us afterwards and let us sit down and study with you from the wonderful, the most wonderful Word of God. Over the course of the, this year, which simply means three months, we have been looking at a new series for 2013, looking at different people of influence within the scriptures, different persons of, in, of uh, influence within the scriptures. We've talked about the influence of Noah. And then last month we looked at the influence of, of Abigail. This morning we're going to look at a very well-known character, that is the influence of one by the name of Moses. And the way that we've approached this study has been like this. These are people who were influential in a time period where there were, where there were wicked influences being brought to bear. With Noah, it was the wicked influence of the world. With Abigail, it was the wicked influence of her husband. This morning, we're looking at a fellow by the name of Moses. What is interesting, when you look at the story of Moses, while Moses was the son of a Hebrew, we understand from the story of Moses that his influence of his parents was only for a short time until he was weaned and then he went to live full time with Pharaoh's daughter, the one who found him when his mother put him in a basket, sent him down a river, because during this time the Pharaoh of the day had declared that all the young men be killed. All the baby men. We'll talk about that here in a few minutes. So here he is being raised in Pharaoh's household. And then at the age of 40, he has to flee the land. And then finally at the age of 80, he comes back. Now in our lifespan, if we began something new at 80, we'd probably be saying to ourselves, well, the good thing is if I mess up, I won't have to do it very long. But with Moses, he was starting afresh at 80 years old to do that which God would have him to do. 80 years of age. The story begins of Moses, though, not with Moses, Moses himself, but with the pharaohs. There were pharaohs, uh, kings, if you would, over Egypt. They were wicked. They were ungodly. Many of them thought they were gods, or at least demanded worship as if they were gods, or maybe the sons of God. And these pharaohs had a great deal of influence upon the people, and in this case in point, the Israelites. If you recall, the Israelites, 400 years earlier, had been led down into the land of Egypt for safety. Joshua, the Lord through Joshua, delivered his family, the, 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 the family of Jacob or of Israel, down to Egypt. 400 years later, they grew and grew and grew. And finally, a point in time had come that there was a Pharaoh who was afraid of them. Down there in the area of Goshen of our land is this huge population of Hebrews. And you know, one day if we're ever attacked, they may rise up against us. And so he had to address the issue. Notice with me in Exodus chapter 1. We see the development of this there in verse 8. And we won't read all of this, but notice his observation in verse 9. He says, look, the people, of the people of the children of Israel are more mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And it happened in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us. And so go up out of the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were in dread of the children of Israel. So much so, he then declares in verse 13, So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. And then it gets worse. He says, we've got a problem with this population of people. The more we oppress them, the more we enslave them, the more they multiply. 
So if we want to get them under control, we've got to have the handmaidens. The ladies who are there, um, <clears throat> the midwives, that is verse 15. We need to give them instructions to kill all the firstborn sons. As soon as the baby's born, if it's a male, throw them into the river. Get rid of them. Well, they didn't do that. The midwives feared God more. And then as it goes on, he issues a declaration <clears throat> that all male children, all male children there in verse 22, needed to be cast into the river. So this was why Moses' mother, Jochebed, would make a basket for him and put him in the basket and float him down the river where Pharaoh's daughter would be. So here we see a Pharaoh that had a great deal of influence on the people of God in a negative fashion. Not to mention the influence of idol worship within the land, but here he was bringing hard-pressed burden upon them. But then he died. This Pharaoh dies. Let's jump forward now to about 40 years later. Moses is 40 years old and he has to leave, he has to flee from the land of Egypt because he stood up for his Hebrew brethren and slew an Egyptian. And then he's in the land of Midian for 40 years. And now it's time for him to come back. And the text tells us in, he, in Exodus chapter 2, beginning of verse 23, that now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. So that, he, that king who had oppressed them so mightily, he died. And then it says that the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage and they cried out and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, his Isaac and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel and God acknowledged them. So this new Pharaoh continues the bondage, continues the oppression, the affliction upon the children of God. So much so that he caused fear within the hearts of the children of God. Notice with me in your Bibles now, turn over to Exodus chapter 5. Exodus chapter 5. This is after Moses now had made it to Egypt and after having several conversations with the Lord where the Lord had to convince Moses that he can do the task, that he can fulfill what God's wanting him to do. He would take Aaron with him. His brother and Aaron would assist with this. Moses finally goes up before Pharaoh. And in chapter 5, going back up to verse 1, he says, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh does not like this request. Matter of fact, he goes on, if you start reading in verse 5, he says, Look, they're supposed to be laboring in the fields. And so if they have enough time to come and ask to go into the wilderness, then they're not working hard enough. He says there in verse 5, look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them rest from their labor. You get them all stirred up, Moses. They quit working now because they think you're going to lead them. And so he says there in verse 6, so the same day he commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers saying, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks for them, for them. brick as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. So he says, now we're going to make it harder on them. They have the same quota of bricks that they are to produce, but now they've got to go and collect their own straw. Well, come down in the text there. Notice how the people reacted to this. In verse 19, and the officers of the children of Israel saw that they were in trouble after it was said, you shall not reduce any bricks from your daily quota. Then as they came out from Pharaoh, they met Moses and Aaron and stood there to meet them. And they said to them, let the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh and the sight of his servants to put a sword in the hand to kill us. So one more time he oppresses the people. And his influence is so much so that they fear him. And they think, Moses, may God judge you for what you have done to us. And the reason is, verse 2 tells us, that Pharaoh had no respect for the God of Israel. Notice what he says there. He says to Moses, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? Pharaoh was a god. He viewed himself as a god or some measure of deity. Who's this god that I should be listening to? A very wicked man creating a very wicked world for Moses and the Israelites. But if you look at the story, this is where the plus side comes in, the positive. Moses then comes to bear with his own influence upon the children of Israel. 
The Lord sat down with him, if you would. He approached them at the burning bush, as we read in the scripture reading earlier. And he talked with Moses. He gave Moses instructions. And he sent Moses to the children of Israel. And notice when Moses, first time, he goes to the children of Israel, he finds a very willing attitude. Verse 29, then Moses and Aaron of Exodus chapter 4. Verse 29, then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders and the children of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. Then he did the signs in the sight of the people. So the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked on their afflictions, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. First time Moses got there, they did the signs. People said, yes, finally we have a deliverer. The Lord has heard our cry, and now he will deliver us. But remember what we pointed out in chapter 5, verse 20? The next time after Moses' first encounter there with the Pharaoh, they changed their tune. They said, let the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh. They didn't want to follow Moses now. Moses, you've went and you spoke, you opened your big mouth, and you've got us in trouble. Why should we listen to you now? Look there in chapter 6, verse 9 of Exodus. So Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel, but they did not heed Moses because of anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. His influence seems to waver at the moment, but Moses does not stop. He doesn't cease in his efforts to carry out the Lord's command. Over 11 different times, Moses goes before Pharaoh. He goes back before Pharaoh one time. And then he goes back before Pharaoh again. And then again. And he gets to a point that the Pharaoh calls him back after each time and says, I'm sorry, we didn't let you go. Please stop this plague that's upon us. And Moses says, okay, I'll go petition of God. And then he does and it stops in Pharaoh's heart and his heart. So the Lord sends him back again. But the point is, can you imagine being Moses? You're 80 years old. And the Lord says, you're going to go up to the leader of probably the greatest nation of the day, and you're going to demand, let my people go. And then when he will not hear you, because he will not, then you will perform these feats. Think about the rod being turned into serpents, the water being turned into blood. Think about the plague of the frogs that was delivered. The plague of the flies that were delivered. Then the plague of the murrain of the cattle where the cattle died and the livestock. And then the hell that was brought forth upon the, 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 the people of Egypt there. And the darkness that was brought upon the land. The boils that struck the people of Israel. All these things God rained down upon them. And every time Moses goes up to Pharaoh, you going to let my people go? All righty, here's what's coming. And then he goes back and he says, all right, I'll petition to you before God. And then he has to go back again for the next plague. The last time, of course, Moses goes up to Pharaoh, the last plague, Pharaoh is so hard-hearted. Moses says to him, look in verse 29 of chapter 10. He says, you have spoken well, I will never see your face again. There is some conversations, very short and very brief after this. Pharaoh loses his oldest born son, as of all of Egypt who does. And finally, Pharaoh says, you've got to get out of my country. You've got to get these people out of here. Take these people and go. And they plunder the land by the people, giving them everything they wanted, all because Moses stood up before Pharaoh and said, let my people go doing the will of God time and time and time again. There's been some speculation as to how long this process took. Months, maybe a year, there's no way of telling. But you'll notice that as it developed, the people stood behind Moses. At first they were afraid after the initial response of Pharaoh. But with every plague, they saw the power of God. How the plague would rain hard upon the hell, would fell hard upon the people of Egypt, but the people there in the land of Goshen, no problems whatsoever. Because God was watching over them. God was taking care of them. And with the Passover feast that the Lord instituted, those who honored the Lord's instructions, their firstborn were saved. But all of Egypt, their firstborn died. 
And so Moses continued to lead the people. There were times I'm sure Moses wanted to give up because it wasn't always an easy task. Think about it, 80 years old, and you are called upon to lead a people so large that there's over 600,000 men on foot. And you've got to now lead these people into the wilderness and then on to the promised land. And so Moses does the job. If you continue to read in chapters 12 and 13 and 14, you see that Moses led them in the observance of the Passover. You see that he led them out of Egypt, leading them, following the Lord, the direction of the Lord, all the way down to the Red Sea. And then at the moment when it looks like all was lost, Moses listened to the Lord and led them through on dry ground. And then he continued. But these people weren't always very cooperative with Moses. The people that he led were not an easy people to lead. They griped and they complained. They had been in bondage for a number of years. Now they're stuck out in the wilderness and so they get thirsty. And they get hungry. And instead of trusting in the Lord to take care of them, they gripe and they complain and they moan and they groan to this leader who has brought them out here to die. I mean, that was their attitude. And so what did Moses do? He kept pushing on. He kept persevering. Notice with me, after they've come up from the Red Sea, and there's this great song that Miriam and Moses sings before the people of Israel, or Moses and, and the children of Israel all sing this song beginning in chapter 15, verse 1. Notice in verse 22, as soon as this is done, it says of Exodus 15, 22, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, when they went out to the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to, to Marah, they could not drink the waters, the waters that were bitter. And so the people said in verse 24, what shall we drink? And he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord resolves the issue. And then as you continue within the same chapter, chapter 16 that is, they then complain about food. And so the Lord provides them with the manna, the bread from heaven. And then you enter into chapter 17. We don't have any water again, Moses. You brought us out here to die in the wilderness again. And then the Lord provides for them again. And it wasn't that the Lord wasn't going to provide. It's just that they doubted the Lord. They did not have faith within the Lord. But Moses kept on. He didn't give up. And even when you come down to Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19, verse 1, all the way through 31, 18, Mo Moses goes up to the mountain, the Lord gives him the law, and he perseveres. He's there 40 days, he comes back down from the mountain in Exodus 32, and the people have already given up on him. Even his brother. Think about that. The people are saying, hey, he's been in the mountains too long, surely he's died. You don't go up the mountain for 40 days and come back alive. He's dead. And so they say, here, give us all your gold jewelry. They give it to Aaron, melt it down, and make us a calf. And he does this, the God that brought you out of Egypt. Moses comes down. And in his leadership capacity, he punishes the people. Remember, he tells those who are on his side to take up his sword. And 3,000 people were killed that day. 3,000 who rebelled against God. 3,000 who disobeyed God. You know, leading people is not an easy task. Because there are times that you have to lead them when things are good and lead them when things are bad. And this was probably one of the worst points since they left Egypt. They're at the base of Mount Sinai after the law had been given to them. They rebelled against God, but yet Moses continued and continued and continued. As a matter of fact, there were a couple of times. One specifically is found in Exodus chapter 16. Oh, not Exodus 16. I've got the wrong um, verse up there, a uh, wrong chapter there on my charts there. But if you'll jump forward over Numbers, in Numbers chapter 16 there, if I get my, my um, recollection properly here, in Numbers chapter 16, we find that there was a great um, rebellion against Moses. Starting Numbers chapter 16 is the chart supposed to say there in verses 41 through 50. Cor said, Moses, you're taking too much upon yourself. We need to be able to lead the people as well. And so in the great rebellion of Korah, the Lord rose up and struck thousands of people dead. 
But that's not the interesting part. Look down at verse 41 of Numbers chapter 16. On the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. You have killed the people of the Lord. Now it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron that they turned toward the tabernacle of meeting and suddenly the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of meeting and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, get away from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces. So Moses said to Aaron in verse 46, take a censer, put fire on it from the altar, put censer on it and take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. Gun. So verse 47, then Aaron took it as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly and already the plague had begun among the people. So he put in the incense and made atonement for the people and he stood between the dead and the living. So the plague was stopped. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700 besides those who died in the core incident. So Aaron returned to Moses at the door of the tabernacle of meeting for the plague had stopped. And this wasn't the only time that Moses had to say, don't kill them all. Wasn't the only time he had to run interference, if you would, or play the part of a mediator between God and the people. Because his first generation rebelled against the Lord. Ultimately, when you look at the life of Moses, one of the things that you find, and the key thing, is that he was faithful to God. We know Moses made mistakes. We understand that. And we understand the reason why he did not enter into the promised land. He let his wrath get the better part of him. When God told him to speak to the rock, instead he struck the rock and he said, Look here, you rebels, what we must do for you. And God said to Moses, Because you've chosen not to glorify my name in front of the people, you will not be able to enter into the promised land. But I tell you what, for 40 years Moses led those people, and he faithfully led them. Even when he had to suffer because of their sin, when they said, no, we can't take the land and listen to the ten cowardly spies, Moses still led them. Moses, may, he may have been tempted to say, you know what? I give up on you guys. I'm going in myself. You've wasted your own life here. But he kept leading them and leading them. And leading them. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 5, tells us something very powerful about Moses. And it's not just a one time occurrence, it's a look into the whole life of Moses seen within this one event. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 5, we read, And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. Moses was faithful in all things. And with that faithfulness, he influenced not just one generation of people, but think about the second generation of Israel. Everyone who was under the age of 20 when they came out of Egypt got to go into the promised land. And who got them to the edge of the promised land? It was Moses and his leadership. He didn't take them into the land. He died before. Joshua picked up the banner at that point and took them in. But Moses' faithfulness influenced not just one, but two generations. And so it's no wonder the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 11, verse 24, he says, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, ra choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward." Moses could have said, I'm not going to do this. I got it good in Pharaoh's household. Why would I want to lead this band of people into the wilderness and into a place that we are not familiar with? He did because of his faithfulness to God. And that's kind of the, the lesson we learned from Moses. One man and his influence over a span of 40 years. He began leading them at 80. He died at 120 how many of us over the last 40 years have influenced that many people within our lives? Think about it. I know we're not leaders of a great nation of people and God hasn't called us to go lead a great nation of people. But within our own lifetime, for those who have lived 40 years or more to the point you've been a Christian for 40 years. How many people have you influenced the way Moses influenced the children of Israel? 
How many people have we touched their lives with the word of God and with light that shines from us when we faithfully observe the law of God? Moses didn't have it easy. And I'll admit that there are some times that we don't have it easy. But we persevere. We press on. The question that we ask with every lesson of this nature, are people within your life better off because they have known you or are they worse off? Have you and I been leading people towards Christ, towards obedience to the gospel, showing them the teachings of the truth and how to live by that word, or have they been directed towards ungodliness? Have they been led away from the body of Christ and his truth? Moses influenced two generations. One rejected him. The second followed what he taught. How about us today? Look at your life. Who do you work with? Who are the people you hang out with when you go and you have your times of recreation? Your family members, your neighbors. Are you influencing them as Moses influenced the Israelites? Showing them faithfulness to God and standing up for what is right. I mean, Moses, if he had not taken the stand at the base of Mount Sinai, it all would have fallen apart there. If he had not taken a stand in the rebellion of Korah, it all would have fallen apart. Moses continued to stand. And that is what we should do today. Let me leave you with one more passage and the lesson will be yours. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Think of this one passage beginning in verse 10 before we close. And ask ourselves, is this what we're doing? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong, in, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand to withstand in the evil day and having done all... To stand. 40 years, 30 years, maybe 60 years. But we have to continue to stand so that we might be the person of influence in our lives, influencing those around us towards God. If you're not a Christian, it is our hope and prayer that if you, as a as a one who regularly attends the services here, that maybe we are influencing you towards obedience to the gospel's call into salvation. If you've heard the truth and you understand the truth, then make the decision today to be convicted by the word of God. The decision to act upon that conviction to repent of your sins and turn in faithful obedience to the Lord. Obey his command to be baptized. And as Jesus says, you will be saved. Paul says you rise up to walk in newness of life. If we've not known you long enough to influence you towards that decision, let us get to know you. Let us sit down and study with you from the word of God. If maybe within your life you as a Christian now, if you've not been the influence around others that you should have been, maybe you've influenced them away from the Lord, then it's time to repent. Turn back to the influence found within the word of God. Turn back with a repentant heart and ask God to forgive you. Then let that outward show of the inward repentance direct others towards God. You being the proper influence now. If you're subject to the gospel's call and invitation, come forward as we stand and as we sing.